Good evening. My name is Allison Kaplan. I am Director of Education at the National First Ladies Library, located at the National First Ladies Historic Site in Canton, Ohio. I want to thank everyone for joining us for tonight's program. We are super excited to get cooking. Um, I want to let you know that we are live tonight on Zoom and Facebook. If you have a question for us, whether you're on Facebook or Zoom, you can leave your questions or comments in the chat. Sarah is going to be cooking tonight and delivering a lot of information about Jacqueline, Jacqueline Kennedy. And we're super excited about the program. So we also will have Michelle Gullion, who is the National First Ladies Library Director of um, collections and research who will be here to answer questions about Jackie Kennedy in the chat as well. Um, so I want to mention a few programs. Hopefully you can hear me. If you are having issues and you are not able to hear the audio, if you are connected through Eventbrite, my recommendation is to click out into Zoom. It's much easier to um, to understand the program that way. So that might be the best recommendation beyond signing out and signing back in. Um, this program is recorded and posted to the National First Ladies Library YouTube page as well as our Facebook page. So if you're having problems connecting, if you have to cut out late or if you have cooking things that you um, want to slow down a bit, um, you are welcome to join us in any way you want. And please spread the word. Please recommend our programs to friends and family members who may be interested in more knowledge about the First Ladies and women's history. Um, we do have a number of really exciting programs that I want to mention to you. Some of you saw them. They were scrolling a little fast, so they might have been hard to understand, but I want to mention a few of our upcoming programs. We have a really great ongoing book club um, that meets on Zoom. It's a discussion-based book club. The books are themed related to First Ladies. Some of them have been fiction, some are non, and we are reading the amazing Eleanor biography by David McCullis. Um, I'm super excited. I've really enjoyed learning more about Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, we are meeting on August 23rd on Zoom. And if you are um, connecting through to us through Eventbrite, you can register there and I'll drop an Eventbrite link as well to that program. So I recommend um, reading that book. It is really engrossing. So don't let the length of it keep you from um, joining us. And no matter where you are in the book, we are happy to have you. Um, we are also hosting as part of our legacy lecture program, History of Women in Air and Space. We're bringing the International Women's Air and Space Museum onto Zoom with us on August 4th for a special lecture about women in flights. Um, we host a virtual film program as well with Stark Library, our local library branch, um, where you can uh, screen a film on Zoom, on Hulu, uh, sorry, on the um, Hoopla system or whatever your preferred screening um, choice is. Um, we use it through the library and um, you can reach um, out to your local library or connect with us through Stark Library. Next month we're going to be watching um, RBG. So if you've seen the um, great um, hit documentary, you can watch it again and join us. We're actually going to go on a really cool tour as part of our program of the Ruth Bader Ginsburg exhibition that is on view at the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage in Cleveland. Um, and it is the first time that this exhibition is stopping um, at a venue since um, 
uh, the notorious RBG has passed away. And it's a really interesting exhibition. So we're gonna get a little video behind the scenes tour. And then um, one of their docent volunteers is gonna answer questions and help us um, discuss the film. So I'm super excited about that. I think it should be really fun. Um, we also have some really fun, if you're into cooking or growing your own food, or if you have children or grandchildren at home, we have a really, really fun um, program this summer that uh, connects to the first ladies and growing your own food. So we're um, selling these kits through Eventbrite um, that relate to Michelle, Ladybird, and Eleanor. They all have information about those first ladies, about initiatives that they led related to growing food or growing flowers, beautifying your world. Um, and they're really fun. We have these really cool illustrated Z packets that are so adorable that look like the first ladies. So um, if you're interested, you can also find out more through our social media pages or Eventbrite about those programs. So without further ado, I'm super excited to turn things over to Sarah Morgan. Um, Jackie Kennedy is probably one of my favorite first ladies for cooking because she has great taste in cocktails. So I'm super excited to mix myself a Clint as I watch this. Um, but first, I want to introduce you to Sarah. Some of you already may be familiar with Sarah through her Instagram page or the National First Ladies Library YouTube, or maybe you've attended some of these programs before. Sarah Morgan has a bachelor's degree in history as well as a passion for the First Ladies. After finding a copy of the First Lady's Cookbook, Favorite Recipes of All the Presidents and of, um, of the United States at a thrift store back in 2019, she began a project on Instagram, Cooking with the First Ladies, with the goal to cook her way through all of the administrations. Now she also creates content for National First Ladies Library, filming videos to share filled with favorite foods and facts and tutorials and recipes. And she's um, pushed out to all sorts of other um, cultural organizations as well, sharing her amazing knowledge about food history and first ladies. So I am super excited to turn things over to Sarah. And if you've ever seen a cooking show behind the scenes, you know how much work goes into something like this. So we are in awe of you, Sarah, and we are so excited to have you here. As always, we wanna remind people, um, if you have a question for Sarah, whether it's about the recipes, about the cooking, please enter it into the chat. We sent recipe cards out, but I will also post them onto the Facebook page and in the chat here so that you have a copy of those links accessible to you as well. And without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Sarah. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, well, hey, y'all. Um, I'm Sarah Morgan, and welcome once again to Cooking with the First Ladies live program for the National First Ladies Library. Um, this evening, uh, like uh, Allison was saying, we're going to be talking about one of the most iconic and beloved First Ladies, Jackie Kennedy. Um, Jackie Kennedy has been one of the most endeared First Ladies um, oops, said something. Um, and a personal favorite um, due to her impeccable fashion sense, her love of history, her perseverance, and her devotion as a mother. Uh, but she was also, um, as CNN's First Lady series described, uh, glamour on the outside, heartache on the inside. Um, if you haven't watched the CNN First Lady series, it's really, really interesting if you're into the First Ladies. Um, she was uh, also known and equally as important uh, for her highly publicized restoration of the White House and her emphasis on arts and culture. Uh, Jackie not only became a global fashion icon, but a symbol of strength for the country. Um, we will be making uh, several dishes this evening, a Boston cream pie, which actually became Massachusetts official state dessert in 1996, a spinach risotto, a Jackie O inspired baked potato, um, as well as a crudité plate um, inspired by Rene Verdon, the French chef hired by Jackie. Um, however, we're gonna start the evening making a Jackie inspired cocktail, um, or maybe two. Um, Jackie actually elevated the role of the cocktail uh, because it said that she kind of scandalized Washington society by introducing pre-dinner cocktails rather than the traditional punch. 
Um, although the press basically complained that everything was getting a little bit too French, everyone adapted fairly quickly to the tradition. Um, essentially, she just didn't leave her mark on fashion and other things, but also the popularity of the cocktail. Um, so the first one that we're going to make is a Negroni, uh, but with a twist. Um, this cocktail was invented by uh, her former Secret Service agent, Clint Hill, uh, who was an American hero after he jumped onto the back of the car during the assassination to protect the First Lady. And so the drink was subsequently known as the Clint. Um, so in order to make this cocktail, we are going to use our shaker. I'm gonna get just a little bit of ice. I'm sorry, I'm mic'd, so I hope it's not too loud. So we're gonna get just a little bit of ice and we are going to do two shots of Campari. Okay, and then we're gonna do one shot of vodka. And uh, we're gonna shake that up just a little bit. Um, I'm gonna add a little bit of orange um, to the mix. And we're gonna pour this out of our shaker. Um, and there you have it, um, a, um, the Clint. Um, so cheers to uh, Clint Hill, who, um, like I said, was just such the American hero um, on the day of the tragic assassination. Um, so I'm also gonna, oh, I forgot to add the soda water. I'm so sorry. Um, and then you're gonna top that off with a little bit of soda water or sparkling water. So there we have it, officially the Clint. Okay, so our next cocktail um, that we are gonna make is uh, the Femme Fatale cocktail. And it is named after um, a cocktail um, that was created especially for Jackie um, when she was overseas. Uh, so one of the hotels created the Femme Fatale. Actually the same hotel uh, claims that they still have the glass that Jackie drank out of while she was there with her red lipstick on it. Not sure if they really do, but it's still kind of a cool story. Um, so for this one, um, we're gonna take our little champagne flute. Um, and uh, this is a champagne based uh, cocktail. Um, so we're going to um, pour, um, it's called creme de fry. I can't speak French real well, but creme de fry. It's, um, a strawberry uh, liqueur. Um, I actually made my own for this one because nowhere um, here in Tennessee, uh, at least in our little area had strawberry liqueur. They had all the other kinds. It's actually really easy to make. Um, the longer, of course, that you let it set, the better it will be. Um, but you basically can just take strawberries, kind of puree them a little bit, put some pieces of strawberries in there, and then just put vodka in it. And you've made your own infused um, strawberry liqueur. So you're just gonna build it a little bit, put a little bit of strawberry liqueur. Actually, we're gonna put, no, that's pretty good. Um, and we're going to put just a dash um, of cognac. And we're gonna top this off with some champagne. Jackie actually is said to have um, drank about one glass of champagne every single day. And we are gonna garnish that as they would with a rose. And I'm gonna throw a little twist on it myself and garnish with a strawberry. Um, so there you have the Femme Fatale, um, again, created just for Jackie. Okay, I'm gonna get a couple of these things out of the way. Um, and then um, I'm gonna start our PowerPoint, um, which uh, will just have a little bit of history about Jackie, the Kennedys, and the countercultural 1960s. So I'm gonna pause here for a second and go over and start the PowerPoint.
Um, so Jackie was first lady in a transitional and turbulent time where sex, love, and rock and roll was the theme. But not only were there protests and social unrest in the streets, but a convergence between the classy 1950s style and expectations and the hippy dippy 60s. The Queen of Camelot in the 60s was one of the most well-known public figures in the world. And although she was young, like most of the generation at that time, she held on to the sophisticated views of earlier decades. Uh, the 60s, often referred to as the age of renewal, actually were one of the younger generations, like I said, with over 50% being under 18 and most being very affluent. The 1960s were not just groovy, they literally had some of the most extremely iconic moments in modern history, from hippies to the Vietnam War, and as the birds would say, every season turn, turn, turns. Elsewhere in the world, construction on the Berlin Wall began in 1961. These moments, from revolutions beginning to astounding achievements, made the decade one of the most memorable and iconic, as well as tumultuous decades in modern history, due to anti-war protests, the civil rights movement, and the assassination of two public figures, Martin Luther King Jr. and of course, JFK. The civil rights movement was at its height. And even though some progress was made with the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which made it illegal to discriminate based on race, color, religion, sex, or nat national origin, there were still many setbacks. One of the most famous moments of the decade was MLK Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech in 1963. Uh, there was, of course, as well, the Cuban Missile Crisis, during which Jackie refused to leave the White House to relocate to a safe shelter. By far, one of the most historic events occurred on July 20th, 1969, when the United States went to space, and Neil Armstrong historically was the first to step foot on the moon and said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. However, another significant scientific achievement was in 1967, when the first heart transplant was completed, which uh, both have been described as totally out of sight. The 1960s were a fashionable time. 1963 saw the feminine mystique and the women's liberation movement, which led to the 1965 introduction of the miniskirt. However, Jackie has remained the most classic style icon. Although the elegance of the 1950s carried over to the 60s, styles, especially inspired by popular model Twiggy, including fake eyelashes, took precedence among some with their threads, including ponchos, love beads, polka dot prints, bell-bottom jeans, go-go boots, psychedelic prints, and with hairstyles, the excessive use of hairspray, which was parodied in the Broadway musical um, and subsequent movies, Hairspray. Uh, Barbies were all the rage, and she even got a boyfriend, Ken. Uh, afros and bell bottoms were boss in the decade of flower power. Lava lamps and trolls were far out, as were sea monkeys, easy bake ovens, beanbag chairs, and chatty Kathy dolls. The Flintstones made their TV debut. Uh, ABC began color telecasts. Pocket sized transistor radios were introduced, as well as eight track stereos for cars and portable record players. Books such as To Kill a Mockingbird, Valley of the Dolls, and A Wrinkle of Time were kind of on their way out as color TV started taking center stage um, with the first television broadcast in color being finally in 1962. The decade also saw the publication of Julia Child's famous cookbook, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, and the debut of her popular cooking show, The French Chef. 1962 also saw the invention of the very first computer game, Space Wars. From Everybody Doing the Twist by Chubby Checker in 1960 to the introduction of Motown, and then on the 9th of February, 1964, the Beatles first performed before a US audience of 75 million viewers, which was over half of the American audience at that time on the Ed Sullivan Show, making the British invasion official. Sadly, however, the 1960s not only saw so many deaths of those fighting for our country or even those innocent people in Vietnam who couldn't help the struggle they were caught in, but it also saw Patsy Cline die in a tragic plane crash, as well as Truman Capote's coverage of the murder of the Clutter family in the book In Cold Blood, and of course, the horrific Helter Skelter of Manson. 1962 saw yet another tragedy when Marilyn Monroe passed away. Of course, Jackie and Marilyn had a relationship of sorts. In the book, 
in the few precious years, the final year of Jack and Jackie, it states that Marilyn once called Jackie and told her that JFK had actually promised to marry her. And Jackie responded by saying, quote, Marilyn, you'll marry Jack, that's great. And you'll move into the White House and you'll assume the responsibilities of the first lady and I'll move out and then you'll have all the problems. Uh, Jackie was relatively aware of some of JFK's alleged affairs, but the potential of the one with Marilyn bothered her the most because it could be the one to become very public and cause a scandal. Jacqueline Lee Bouvier was born on July 28, 1929 in Southampton, New York to Janet, a socialite, and John Bouvier III, a successful Wall Street broker. In fact, she was the first first lady to have been born in a hospital. Uh, Jackie grew up in a wealthy and privileged family. She was a skilled equestrian who began riding horses at the age of one. By the time she was 11, she had won several national championships and in 1940, the New York Times actually wrote a piece about her accomplishments after she had a double victory, which was rare for young writers in the same show. As a young lady, she took classical ballet lessons and studied French. Although she uh, led a very privileged childhood, she was deeply affected by her parents' divorce in 1940, which included her mother's remarriage, as well as her father's alcoholism, affairs, and financial strug struggles, which stemmed from issues after the crash of 1929. Jackie attended first grade at Miss Chapin's school on East End Avenue in New York. One of her teachers, Mrs. Platt, thought Jackie was, quote, a darling child, the prettiest little girl, very clever, very art artistic, uh, but full of the devil. Um, a few times, Jackie was actually even sent to the headmistress, uh, all mostly because she would finish her work quickly, get bored, and then act out. She graduated from Miss Porter's school, a boarding school in Connecticut for girls in June, 1947. She attended Vassar College in New York and in her junior year, she spent a year studying abroad in Paris. Uh, she said, quote, I loved it more than any year of my life. Being away from home gave me a chance to look at myself with a jaundiced eye. I learned not to be ashamed of a real hunger for knowledge, something I had always tried to hide. And I came home glad to start in here again but with a love for Europe that I am afraid will never leave me. After returning home, she transferred to George Washington University to be closer to her family. She ultimately graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in French Literature. In 1951, she began her first job for the Washington Times Herald newspaper with the title of The Inquiring Camera Girl. She would wander the city and take pictures of people as well as ask them pressing questions about current issues and events. She not only interviewed Richard Nixon, but also covered the Eisenhower inauguration and Queen Elizabeth II's coronation. And not only had these experiences, but she also had visited the White House back in 1941 as a tourist with her family. Ironically, she turned down an internship at Vogue because the current editor told her it might harm her potential marriage. In 1950, uh, excuse me, she met John F. Kennedy in 1952 who was a congressman at the time and was elected Senator of Massachusetts later that same year. At a dinner party in Washington, DC, another person she also interviewed. Uh, but after their first meeting, Jack said, quote, I've never met anyone like her. Uh, Jack actually proposed to her by hiding a ring inside of a piece of potato at the bottom of a bowl of clam chowder, supposedly at Martin's Tavern in Boston on July 24th, 1953, which actually has a booth marking the event. Uh, however, some say it occurred at the Omni Parker, which is in Boston as well. Jackie and John married on September 12, 1953 in Newport, Rhode Island, and she described it as ethereal. Their storybook wedding was attended by 800 guests with an additional 400 showing up at their reception. And ultimately it took them two hours to greet everyone. Jackie's wedding dress was designed by Anne Lowe, an up and coming talented African-American dressmaker. The original wedding dress also had another story of its own. It was destroyed after a pipe burst along with nine of the bridesmaids dresses in a flood um, in Lowe's studio 10 days before the wedding. Lowe and her staff worked around the clock to remake them and save the day. However, sadly, Lowe uh, was not only uncredited for her design work, but also in her part for basically rescuing their wedding day. Uh, they, cut, they honeymooned in, uh, for two weeks in Acapulco and spent the next week on the California coast. 
ending their trip with a stay in a Beverly Hills mansion uh, that was later featured in the Godfather, tr Godfather trilogy. Um, they even received blessings from the Pope. One of their courses at their wedding reception was a course of fruit salads served in a pineapple, which happens to be one of her favorite foods. Uh, the Kennedys unfortunately treated Jackie as, quote, like Rhode Island, meaning an asset. But Jack had an admiration and overwhelming pride for her. JFK announced his presidency in January of 1960, and the couple immediately began traveling the country, campaigning, and during this time, Jackie learned she was pregnant. And after being ordered by her doctor to stay at home, she continued to, continued to answer hundreds of letters um, and wrote um, a, an article, excuse me, a weekly newspaper column called The Campaign Wife. Uh, JFK, of course, ultimately beat Nixon to become the 35th president of the United States. And just less than three weeks later, Jackie gave birth to their second child, John Jr. They were the only first couple to have a baby between Election Day and Inauguration Day. The Kennedys had multiple instances of miscarriages. And unfortunately, in August of 1963, Jackie gave birth to Patrick, their third child, who unfortunately suffered from issues with his lungs and passed away at the Children's Hospital in Boston. Jackie was only 31 years old when JFK, the youngest person ever elected president, as well as the first Catholic to be elected, was sworn into office on January 20th, 1961, making her the third youngest first lady of all time at that point. On inauguration night, it was snowing and Jack turned on the lights inside the car so people could see Jackie because she was so beautiful. Later, she would say to him, quote, oh, Jack, what a day. However, they actually gave her amphetamine pills so she could attend the inaugural balls due to her fatigue after giving birth so recently. Uh, she also once said, quote, the one thing I do not want to be called is first lady. It sounds like I'm a saddle horse. Would you notify the telephone operators and everyone else that I'm to be known simply as Mrs. Kennedy and not first lady? The Kennedys brought a youthful and fresh spirit to the White House and they both believed that the White House should be a place that celebrated American culture, history, and the country's achievements. However, her main obligation was to be a good wife and a great mother, saying, quote, if you bungle raising your children, I don't think whatever else you do matters very much. One of her first priorities was turning the sun porch into a school for Caroline and other staff members' children uh, to use as uh, their schooling situation, and also installing a swing set and treehouse on the White House lawn for both of her children. Another of Jackie's first major projects as First Lady was the restoration and preservation of the White House, and her goal was for the public to have a greater appreciation of the history of the residents as well as the former First Ladies and Presidents. This led her to create the first curator position for the White House, um, as well as a White House Fine Arts Committee which collected furniture and artifacts from around the country that belonged to former residents of the home. Jackie fully restored all of the public rooms in the White House and famously presented her achievements on a television program on uh, CBS, a tour of the White House with Mrs. Kennedy on February 14, 1962, which drew an audience of 80 million viewers. Uh, she was nominated and won an Emmy for the program, making her the first first lady to ever win the award. Another of her focuses during the time as First Lady was the arts. She hosted several dinners and events where she invited artists, poets, authors, scientists, and musicians to mingle with politicians and diplomats. She also redesigned the First Lady's Garden, which was later renamed for her at the White House, uh, which it had been neglected for years. Jackie also updated the Rose Garden and afterwards in 1961 had a rose named after her. The Rosa Prima First Lady Rose is described as being the pure embody embodiment of innocence and elegance with its color being reminiscent of ivory antique piano keys. Her favorite flower, however, was not a rose, but white peonies and blue cornflowers. Jackie uh, traveled the world alongside her husband with trips to Paris, Vienna, Greece, Italy, India, and Pakistan. Uh, her interest in other countries and their culture, along with her ability to speak several foreign languages, including French, Spanish, and Italian, made her an amazing representative of the United States and was popular with foreign diplomats. However, one trip did not go so well. 
When Jackie and John visited Buckingham Palace in June of 1961, she slightly insulted the queen when a few weeks later, she supposedly said that Elizabeth was, quote, a middle-aged woman so incurious, unintelligent, and unremarkable that Britain's new reduced place in the world was not a surprise, but an in inevitability. She went on to describe the palace also as, quote, a second-rate, dilapidated, and sad, like a neglected provincial hotel. The whole incident actually plays out in a Netflix episode of The Crown, uh, much as which has um, all been slightly proven to have some truth to it, but no one can actually know for sure. We do know that whatever was said, Jackie did apologize later. Queen Elizabeth subsequently opened a memorial in the UK in 1965, near the area where the Magna Carta was signed by King John back in 1215 um, for JFK after his assassination. Uh, which was attended by Jackie and her children. And currently uh, the establishment is um, also the Kennedy Memorial Trust for the British government and award scholarships to British postgraduate citizens who choose to attend Harvard or MIT. As, first, uh, uh, as a first lady, Jackie started fashion trends rather than following them. Uh, Jackie also became a world renowned fashion icon as first lady. And after the election, she commissioned Oleg Cassini who was a family friend of the Kennedys to design her own personal wardrobe and to whom she referred to as the secretary of style, many of which are some of her most iconic looks. He created over 300 ensembles for her, uh, including her inaugural day coat, as well as her dress for the inaugural ball and many of her outfits she was photo photographed in on their official international travels. Uh, ultimately, her love of not only French food and culture, but her preference for French designers such as Chanel, Balenciaga, Givenchy, and more became a slight issue with the American people. She attended to find American designers to use, one of which was Ben Zuckerman, who created a purple wool coat for Inauguration Day, but she instead wore that to meet Mamie Eisenhower to tour the White House. During this tour, Jackie had just given birth a few hours earlier to John Jr. and was offered a wheelchair, but declined and walked instead. Although Jackie called Mamie gracious as a host, Mamie had previously referred to her as the college girl because she was ultimately very jealous of her youthfulness and also sincerely did not want to leave the White House. Jackie hand selected every piece of her wardrobe down to the small details and was very aware of the influence her fashion choices had. Uh, during the infamous trip to Dallas, she actually hand wrote an itinerary for the trip which included a detailed list of every outfit and item she planned to wear and when, including her jewelry for each one. Her symbolic look, the Jackie look, featured tailor suit, tailored suits with knee-length skirts, three-quarter sleeves on the jacket, elbow-length gloves, sleeveless A-line dresses, low heel pumps, and pillbox hats, all of which became extremely popular in the United States especially. Her signature bouffant hairstyle was also popularized, and more than any other first lady, her style and look was copied by commercial manufacturers and young ladies. One of her signature pieces during her time as first lady as well was her classic triple strand pearl necklace created by American jeweler Kenneth J. Lane. In addition, a Tiffany & Co. designer created what is known as the berry brooch, which is strawberries made of rubies and diamond stems and leaves uh, made of emeralds and was not only personally chosen by JFK, but also given to her by him prior to the inauguration. Another jewelry designer she adored was Schlumberger, and she wore his gold and enamel bracelet so much in the 60s, they became known as Jackie bracelets. The Metropolitan Museum of Art once said, quote, she set the standard for how an entire generation of women wanted to look, dress, and behave. And in fact, in 1965, she was named to the International Best Dress List Hall of Fame. On November 21st, 1963, Jackie and John left for a trip to Texas, the first time she had joined him on this type of trip in the United States. On the next day, November 22nd, they had breakfast and then took a short flight from Fort, Fort Worth to Dallas's Love Field. Jackie was famously wearing a beautiful pink Chanel suit with a signature pillbox hat which had actually been personally chosen by President Kennedy. The motorcade where the governor of Texas, as well as LBJ uh, followed, was heading to the trademark where the president was to give a speech. 
As the car drove slowly past cheering crowds, shots rang out. And when they neared the Texas School Book Depository, um, almost immediately after the bullet struck Jack in the head, Jackie began to climb out of the back of the limousine. Clint Hill, again, who created her specialty cocktail we made, remembers telling the Warren Commission he had to jump onto the back of the car in order to get her back into her seat. Um, although he was rushed to nearby Parkland Hospital and Jackie was actually present in the operating room, he sadly, of course, passed away and Jackie became a widow at the age of 34. Jackie later said she thought the sounds of the gunshots were the car backfiring. Jackie continued to wear the infamous bloodstained Chanel suit as she boarded Air Force One to be present as LBJ took the oath of office because not only did he want her to be present to demonstrate his legitimacy as the next president, but also in order to quote, I want them to see what Jack, what they did to Jack. She even later said that she regretted washing her blood, bloodstained hands and face because of the same reason. She honestly wanted them to see what they had done to him. The suit, unlaundered, was donated to the National Archives and Records Administration in 1964, but per Caroline Kennedy's request, will not be on display until 2103. The iconic pink suit and pillbox hat has also become a symbol of her husband's assassination and has kind of um, another story of its own. Because of her scrutiny over wearing French designers, the Chanel suit was an exact replica made with fabric Chanel sent from Paris to New York where it was actually sewn. After the assassination, Jackie became very close with his brother, Robert, and he was a source of support for her and the children. And she was ultimately very supportive of him in his 1964 campaign for Senator. Jackie was very involved in planning the funeral, uh, which she modeled after former President Lincoln's. She requested a closed casket, which Robert Kennedy was kind of opposed to. And the funeral service was held at the Cathedral St. Matthew the Apostle in Washington, DC. Jackie walked alongside the procession to the actual burial site in Arlington Cemetery and also lit the eternal flame created in his honor. She ultimately put her wedding band in the casket with him, which was one of her most sentimental pieces um, and was made by one of her favorite jewelers, Van Cleef and Arpels, and boasted a 2.8 carat diamond and a 2.8 carat emerald. Also, Jackie, soon after JFK's death, began planning the memorial to her husband, the JFK Presidential Library and Museum, which overlooks the Boston Harbor. And I've had the privilege to visit. And if any of you get the chance, I would highly recommend it. A week after the assassination, Jackie was interviewed by Theodore White of Life Magazine, where she compared their years in the White House to King Arthur's Camelot, because JFK often listened to the musical before bed. And she famously said, quote, don't let it be forgot that for once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. There will be great presidents again, but there will never be another Camelot. She actually made it a stipulation basically saying no Camelot quote, no story. Also in that next week after the assassination, LBJ issued the executive order establishing the Warren Commission to investigate the event during which Jackie, among others, of course, gave a deposition. Months later, of course, it determined that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Jackie and her children stayed in the White House for two weeks following the assassination. And although LBJ offered her an ambassadorship to France, she declined. And many believed that she was suffering from PTSD following the experience. And she spent most of the next few years in private. And one of the only events she attended during that time was an appearance in DC to honor Clint Hill, who again was the brave secret service agent who shielded her that fateful day. Eventually, she came uh, back to the public eye when in 1967, during the Vietnam War, she was given the title um, America's uh, Unofficial Roving Ambassador by Life Magazine when she traveled with a former British ambassador to the United States to Cambodia, which is seen as a start of the relationship repair between the two countries. She also attended Martin Luther King Jr.'s funeral in 1968 in Atlanta. Jackie is also, of course, best known for her fashionable and iconic style, as well as the influence she had over the fashion industry. Although her impeccable and enviable sense of style made her a trendsetter, she really disliked the excessive focus by the media and the public on her appearance. 
In um, the 1970s, she prevented the destruction of historic buildings along Lafayette Square in DC, which includes the Renwick Building that is now part of the Smithsonian. And in New York City, she led a campaign to save and restore Grand Central Station, which now over 500,000 people pass through each day. And it actually includes a plaque in the term terminal recognizing her role in the preservation. Smaller yet still contributions to preservation include getting the Columbus Circle canceled, which would have drastically changed the way people enjoy Central Park today, and also the Olana, AKA the Frederick Irwin Church in New York. In 1968, Jackie married Aristotle Onassis, a Greek shipping magnate who was over 20 years older than her and one of the wealthiest men in the world. They were married in a Greek Orthodox ceremony on his private island in Greece. And by taking his last name, not only became Jackie O, but lost her entitlement of secret service protection. Her wedding dress was Valentino, and she was not only a huge fan of his designs, but he himself credits her for the Valentino boom. When she attended the Met Gala in 1979, where she of course had an existing relationship with the establishment, but that was mostly due to her work on various costume exhibits throughout the 1970s. Um, she wore Valentino to that event. The marriage to Onassis not only changed her popularity with the American public, because many saw it as a betrayal to JFK, but also changed her style as she switched from tailored looks and suits to a more bohemian resort style, large sunglasses and headscarves by Hermes, which she also slept in as well as a silk pillow to maintain her blowout hairstyles. She also started a trend of white jeans without a belt and a black turtleneck that was not tucked in. Jackie also spent um, approximately $1.25 million, which would be close to 9 million today on her wardrobe during her first year of marriage to Aristotle. Jackie was seen as a trophy wife um, to Aristotle and was so differently portrayed than she was during her time as first lady. Um, it led to the press referring to her as quote, a spendthrift and reckless woman. After his death, she revived her image, and when she moved back to New York, uh, not only began her publishing career, but also put more of a focus on preserving President Kennedy's legacy, charity work, and family. Her new career as an editor began at Viking Press in 1975. She later moved to Doubleday as a senior editor and enjoyed her successful publishing career until her death in 1994. During her career, a few of the notable books she edited included the autobiographies of Carly Simon, as well as Michael Jackson's Moonwalk. This was not her first experience with novels because as a senator, JFK suffered from debilitating back pain due to football injuries and had to have two surgeries. During his recovery, Jackie encouraged him to write Profiles in Courage, a book about senators who fought for what they believed in despite putting their careers in danger. Um, that book actually won a Pulitzer in 1957. Jackie also continued to have a part in politics and attended the Democratic National Convention in 1976. She also attended the event at Faneuil Hall in Boston along with her former mother-in-law, Rose Kennedy, when Ted uh, Kennedy announced his uh, intentions uh, to challenge uh, the incumbent president, Jimmy Carter. She also supported the Clintons monetarily during his campaign in the 90s and then after the election, giving Hillary advice in which Hillary later said that Jackie was, quote, a source of inspiration and advice for me. However, one day in 1993, Jackie was horseback riding when she fell from the horse. Subsequently, she was diagnosed with a swollen lymph node in her groin area, which turned out to be non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which unfortunately spread to her brain, spinal cord, and liver, and was then considered terminal cancer. Jackie underwent chemotherapy, but died in her sleep in her Manhattan apartment on May 19, 1994, with her children by her side, with it being described by John Jr. as, quote, surrounded by her friends and her family and her books and the people and things that she loved. Um, and also that she did it in her very own way, on her own terms, and he thought they all felt lucky for that. Shortly after her death on May 23rd, um, 1994, Jackie's funeral was held at a Catholic parish uh, where she was actually baptized and confirmed um, earlier in life. Then she was buried alongside President Kennedy and their infant son, Patrick, and their stillborn uh, daughter, Arabella, in Arlington National Cemetery. Her estate at the time of her death was valued at a whopping $43.7 million. Above all else, Jackie sought to preserve and protect America's cultural heritage, and she captivated the nation and the entire world with her intelligence, beauty, and grace. With a deep sense of devotion to her family and country, 
She dedicated herself to raising her children and to making the world a better place through art, literature, and a respect for history and public service. All of the above have made her one of the most well-known and most beloved First Ladies. And in 2011, she was ranked in the top five most influential First Ladies of the 20th century for her, quote, profound effect on American society. More recently, she was featured on Time Magazine's 100 Women of the Year, and many people still strive to emulate not only her fashion, which continues to inspire the industry to this day, but her poise and grace. Her legacy lives on just like Camelot. All right, so although many politicians have been from Boston, JFK has many bar rooms as well as restaurants named after him more than any other, including the Lock Ober, where he ate with friends, the Kennedy booth at the Union Oyster House, where he supposedly ate lobster too, and the Omni Parker Hotel, as well as the other tavern, where both claim he supposedly proposed to Jackie. Now, she occasionally followed a strict diet, which included a simple dish of cottage cheese, but she would also go on a fruit fast if she felt she was eating too heavy. Fruit in general was something she really enjoyed, from fruit salads to cottage cheese with fruit. Jackie was also a relatively picky eater. She did, however, love poached uh, chicken or fish, especially salmon. And usually for breakfast, she simply had a hard boiled egg and a cup of tea or coffee. She also preferred lamb, which was served at many of their state dinners. Although she maintained a diet, she loved desserts, one being strawberries Romanoff and another being brownies, which according to her assistant, she used to swipe from the White House kitchen. Another snack she enjoyed was Jiffy popcorn, which was invented in 1959. Also, strangely enough, Sam Adams Boston Lager was originally known as Jackie O. Suds because she enjoyed beer and would hold her pillbox hat over her stomach to hide her beer cut. Just kidding. Uh, however, like I said earlier, she did uh, supposedly enjoy a glass of champagne um, every day. All right, so let's get cooking. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to make tonight um, is the Boston cream pie. And so I know that most of you have your recipe cards. I have my recipe cards in front of me as well. Um, and I have already pre-made a couple of the things um, since we don't have tons of time, um, but um, it's kind of a little bit more of a difficult recipe to make. And in fact, Boston cream pie actually isn't pie at all, it's a cake more like a sponge cake. Um, so uh, tonight um, I'm going to show you how to make the sponge cake itself. And then um, we're gonna decorate up our pre-made Boston cream pies. So first what you'll need is seven eggs separated, your um, yolks and your whites. Um, you're gonna need a tablespoon of butter um, as well as one cup of flour and one cup of sugar. So what we'll do first, um, is um, take our whites, add those in, and then half of the sugar. And I do want to say a disclaimer. I, of course, am a historian by nature. I'm not a chef, so um, I do the best I can. I really enjoy learning about first ladies and what foods that they ate, and it's been such a fun project. So we're gonna let that get going for just a minute. Okay. And then we're going to add in our egg yellows and the rest of the sugar. And finally, we're gonna slow, we're gonna slowly add in um, our butter and our flour. Uh, 
Um, so here I have um, two of the previous Boston cream pie uh, sponge cake that I made. I made one that's a little smaller and a little thicker and uh, one that's kind of more of the flat style. And we are going to um, add in our pastry cream as soon as uh, this is done. Okay, and so that is how you would make these sponge cakes. Now to make uh, your uh, pastry cream, it is a tablespoon of butter, two cups of milk, two cups of light cream, a fourth a cup of sugar, and three and a half tablespoons of cornstarch. Um, so once uh, you have um, kind of gotten that all cooked up, then you're going to want to refrigerate that. Um, the longer you refrigerate it, the better. Um, really, it's an overnight recommendation. Um, and then once you get it back out, you're just going to want to kind of stir it back up so you can kind of get some of the lumps out of it. And so then we're just going to take some of our pastry cream here and fill the inside of our two pieces. Some people also make Boston cream pie um, with yellow cake as well. So um, if the sponge cake doesn't sound too good for you, you can also um, use a yellow cake mix and make it just a little bit simpler. Um, then our final step is going to be the chocolates. Um, so to make that, um, I would actually recommend, and I know what the recipe cards say, um, but there's some simpler uh, kind of icing uh, chocolate recipes out there um, that kind of give it a little bit more of a glazed look. Um, but the recipe um, that is on the cards is the official one from the Omni Parker Hotel in Boston, uh, which kind of credits um, kind of the invention um, of the Boston cream pie. Um, there's actually another joke in addition to the Sam Adams is that JFK invented Boston cream pie, which of course he didn't. And he also invented Boston baked beans um, and that Jackie was the one that uh, decided to separate the two and not have um, them together um, all in one dish. Um, so then, you know, we'll just put our little top back on there. And then we're gonna take our chocolate syrup which again, or icing, however you want to say, and then you're just going to kind of pour it on top and you're going to want it to drip down the sides in a traditional Boston cream pie fashion. And I'm kind of making a chocolate mess, which I don't think is a bad thing. Um, but. All right. So there you have it. Boston cream pie. Scooch those over. Actually, it looks a little better from that side. Um, so the next thing uh, that we're going to make um, is uh, spinach uh, risotto, or some call it green risotto. Um, and it's also, it's really simple to make. I pre-made um, our risotto, um, just because we probably wouldn't have 25 minutes to sit here and watch it cook on the stove. But you're basically, you're just gonna um, take your risotto. And if you go to the store, um, you wanna find plain risotto. Um, lots of them are cheese-based, which of course is a signature of risotto dishes, but Jackie did not eat hers with any cheese. It was simply um, spinach risotto. So you'll take your spinach risotto and cook it, um, add your splash of uh, white wine, um, as well as um, beef stock, um, and then just cook it until it's done, sort of, of course, like rice. The next thing 
Um, and this is again, a very plain dish, but it was something she really enjoyed. You're gonna take a food processor um, and take your spinach. And you're just gonna chop it up. And then you will add the paste to the risotto. And that was one of her favorite dishes. She, she enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, but again, it's just very strange uh, that it didn't have any cheese at all, except we will put a little Parmesan on top um, because she would allow that. So we're gonna chop this up just a little bit. I've got a couple more pieces of spinach I'm gonna to add to this. Um, you can also, um, according to the recipe, this all came from a book um, that was written um, about a lady who worked in the White House uh, kitchen. Um, so you, one of her suggestions was that you could also um, go ahead and uh, boil this a little bit first and make it a little softer um, so it wasn't quite as chunky. We're gonna just hit it one more time and then add it to our uh, risotto. Okay, I'm sure you guys have had enough of uh, the food processor sounds. Um, so you'll just kind of have a little bit of like a very fresh spinach paste and we will mix it in uh, with our risotto. And there you have it is Jackie Kennedy's uh, green risotto. Um, she was actually a very picky eater. Um, and again, kind of was on a lot of diets a lot of the times um, and kind of had an interesting food choices. Some of her other favorite foods, um, which if you uh, either go to the National First Lady's Library um, YouTube, um, or uh, my Instagram page at Cooking with the First Ladies. Um, you can go back to my Jackie videos and things like that that I've done in the past. Um, she really liked beef stroganoff um, and had a really good recipe for that. Um, so if you're interested in cooking or that sort of thing, her beef stroganoff recipe is fantastic. And it's one that my family has uh, requested over and over again. When are you going to make Jackie Kennedy's uh, beef stroganoff? Okay, so we'll just kind of mix this in here. The risotto is a little tough since I cooked it earlier today. This would be much easier if you add that in when it's piping hot. All right, so there you have Jackie Kennedy's green risotto or spinach risotto. Okay, so the next thing, uh, oh, we have to add our Parmesan cheese to it. I almost totally forgot, I'm sorry. Yep, you gotta add a little bit of Parmesan cheese to the top and a fresh block of Parmesan cheese is significantly better than the Parmesan cheese that you can just buy pre-shredded. Okay. Um, so our next one is also equally uh, very, very easy to make. Um, it's just interesting. Um, so of course, um, you'll just bake your potato, wrap it up in foil, butter, a um, little salt, a little pepper. Um, and cook it to how it would be done. Um, I cooked mine on 350 for uh, a little over an hour. Um, and Jackie liked hers topped with sour cream, 
and being the fancy lady uh, that she was, caviar. Um, so we're gonna add a little caviar to the top, which if you, I'm not sure, um, stores in our little area <laughs> don't really sell this. It's not very easy to find either. Um, but Whole Foods carries it. Um, and you can get black or um, various different kinds of caviar. Um, I went with the salmon. So very simple, Jackie Kennedy style baked potato. Um, now our last uh, dish that we're gonna make tonight is our crudite platter. Um, this is also kind of um, another simple one. Uh, and it's actually just kind of a uh, French version um, of a vegetable tray. Um, charcuterie, charcuterie boards are so big right now um, that I just thought this was neat, but she loved putting these kind of together and serving things like this. So um, this one had rainbow carrots, snap, uh, snap peas, um, heirloom tomatoes, as well as Persian cucumber, um, also a French baguette. Um, now to make the butter here is a half a cup of unsalted butter, um, half a tablespoon of dried tart cherries, um, fresh thyme, and half a teaspoon of honey, or you can also use maple syrup. Just put all of that in your food processor and blend it up. Um, so that's a nice little addition. I also added some uh, garlic hummus as well. Um, but we are actually going to make um, our little... Um, oil dish here, which is uh, six sprigs of fresh thyme, put those in there. Um, peppercorns, black peppercorns. Um, the recipe calls for eight. Um, I'm probably gonna put a couple extra in there. Um, then we're gonna add in uh, two garlic cloves. Again, I'm gonna add in a little extra. I really like garlic. And then, four sun-dried tomatoes. And then you can also make this ahead of time um, for your, this is the marinated uh, feta um, and refrigerate it before you add it to your uh, tray. Um, and then you're gonna take seven ounces of feta cheese. Put that in. Cheese and chocolate mess. I, I, don't, I don't think that's a bad thing either, cheese mess. Okay. And then finally, a fourth of a cup of extra virgin olive oil. And then you can just put the lid on that. Take it up a little bit. And then, like I said, the longer you let it set, the better. Um, but here you have your marinated feta, which we will put in this little dish. And you have a lovely little platter here to serve um, at your next cocktail party or your next get together. Um, so um, I hope y'all enjoyed this evening. I do have one more story to share. Um, it's one of my favorite stories um, is um, this photo here. I was lucky enough to visit with her this past weekend and she gave me a copy of the photo. Um, I know it's gonna be hard to see, uh, but here's Robert Kennedy during his campaign for president. Um, and this uh, lovely lady with the scarf on is my mama uh, who rode alongside with him in the car during that campaign um, when he came to our small town. So it's very cool. She also gave me my Kennedy uh, campaign things on the back. So although those aren't JFK, um, those are Robert Kennedy. I also uh, would just like to say, um, I look forward to answering your questions. My Jackie O inspired large sunglasses. Um, I hope y'all had a wonderful time, a groovy time this evening, learning about the countercultural 60s and Jackie Kennedy, um, as well as learning about the Clint, the film Patel, spinach risotto, Boston cream pie, 
Jackie's very unique way to eat a baked potato and our crudite platter. So thanks y'all so much. And if you all do have any questions, I hope that I can answer them. Hi, Sarah, that was wonderful. I'm always inspired by your PowerPoint presentations that are so <laughs> animated and colorful and active. So that was really fun as well as seeing so many for, for maybe the first time uh, recipes and things that I could really connect to, like you were saying, the crudite um, and charcuterie plate that's so popular now, thinking about silk pillowcases and white jeans and boho look. Um, Jackie seems so contemporary as far as the things that she was um, wearing and thinking about and serving. Um, why do you think that was? Or do you think that people just connect to her today still? I really do. I think she's just timeless. And I mean, a lot of things come and go. I mean, as we've seen things roll around, um, you know, you'll be like, oh man, that was popular. And that, you know, um, but I think Jackie was just this very classic individual. I think she is just timeless. Um, and I also think that even to this day, like I was saying earlier, that she still has such an impact on the fashion industry, that they still look back to her and her style. And she was so meticulous, just down to the every little detail. She picked out her outfit, her belts, her jewelry. It was all tailored and all designed for her. Um, I do actually have an interesting fact that I forgot to mention it is about fashion. Um, so it was ever so slight. I think it was said that it was only like about a grain of rice, but one of her legs was technically slightly shorter than the other one. And um, one of her assistants or something uh, had just has just written a book not all that long ago, but um, all of her heels, um, one heel was just a little taller than the other one. But you would have never noticed, even if she hadn't done that. But it was just tailored down to that very little bit. So. The other question I had for you was about Jackie Kennedy and her diet. So she kept a pretty slim figure and I've read some feedback from some of her assistants that she was very careful in counting her calories and thinking about what she was consuming and eating and trying to stay at 120 pounds all the time. But they would run into her in the middle of the night um, scarfing down ice cream um, and just thinking of National Ice Cream Day. Um, are there any like go-to like sweets or things that you know that she was really excited about or um, any like diet related things that you read about her that surprised you? Um, I didn't really read too, too much into her diets, except for kind of what I mentioned um, earlier about the fruits, which I know two desserts she loves are not only strawberries Romanoff, but also strawberries and like Devonshire cream. Um, and she did use to swipe the brownies um, from the White House kitchen. Um, so she's kind of sneaky about that. But I, I actually wouldn't really even say it was sneaky because um, she actually did not even like to eat at all in public. Um, she also would never, she was also, she smoked, um, which, you know, when you look into Jackie Kennedy, that's not one thing that'll stand out. You don't think of her as a smoker. You don't see her portrayed that way. And that's because she did not want them to photograph her that way. She like the staff at the White. she was not, they were not allowed to take a picture of her smoking. So I think that sometimes people attribute that with keeping a thin figure and things, but she, she wasn't ever photographed that way, but it's also the same with food. I think she just kind of had um, a strange relationship with food, in my opinion, not in a negative way, but just, she never wanted to be pictured in a way that might be unflattering. So um, I didn't, like I said, I didn't really read in too much into her diets. Um, I just know that she was, she was just very picky um, and just very meticulous on what she liked to eat. And she was a huge fruit fan, which is wonderful. So, um, but she was, she did kind of sneak around and, and um, that sort of thing. 
I also remember reading about her as an editor and that she would work through lunches and people would complain that they were hungry and she'd pull out a carrot sticks and say, <laughs> oh, that sounds people. about right. So one of the questions in the chat was related to some of the state dinners and um, what kind of cuisine she presented, like mm -hmm. what um, her role was, if she was really involved. And I know Michelle gave some feedback um, here that she wanted the presentation to be beautiful and the cuisine to be first rate. Renee Verdon, the French chef she hired, served three courses and people sat at round tables for ease of conversation. So um, that sort of conversation thing seems pretty modern for a state dinner. Did you have any other insight to some of those larger dinners or events that she hosted? Um, I'm kind of just going to have to agree with that. I know I don't think she was as hands on as some of other first ladies uh, who would kind of like go in the kitchen and be like, you know, this is how I like it. This is how I want it sort of thing. Not that I've really seen. Um, and beyond that, I just know a, like a lot of what she would serve was, uh, of course, very French based foods. Um, don't have it in front of me or around me, but um, you can actually, they're, one of their state dinners with the presidential seal is a, is a menu that you can actually see online. Um, and I cooked that meal, um, which has been a minute ago now, um, which one of which I'm pretty sure the beef stroganoff was featured on, uh, but just very French, very, you know, very fancy and just ever, she was just so detail oriented just in about just everything that she did. Um, one question that another uh, attendee had was, was Jackie a good cook? Was she in the kitchen very often? No, no. She, I don't know if she was, I, I haven't read anything that says she was not a good cook. I just know she really wasn't a cook. She didn't really cook. Um, however, um, I think she like would make waffles. Pretty sure. Um, that she would make waffles that were supposedly pretty good that her for her children that they would like. Um, but yeah, she wasn't really a kitchen lady. Um, she'd actually um, said once that um, the thought of being a housewife um, was just terrible to her. She did not ever want to be um, at home. She didn't want to be the cook, you know, doing the laundry, that sort of thing. Um, even though being a mother as well as a wife was top priority to her. Um, she wanted to go and do. So I, she was not in the kitchen very often, um, which is funny because I don't think that she probably would have made any of these things, um, but they were just her favorite food. Did, how, how much did her travels influence her um, cooking and eating and consuming? Um, I've seen some pictures of her when she was traveling in Italy, along with Clint, um, the, the Secret Service agent, um, where the Negroni came up, um, and it looks like she's eating some pasta dishes, and then her love for French culture. How influential was, was that love of French culture on um, what she served and what she ate? Yeah, for sure, all of it. Um, during her time spent abroad in France uh, during her college years, I think that just totally changed her, um, especially it just influenced her in just about every capacity. Um, also with her travels, um, yeah, she was really, really, really into languages and cultures, um, which is why when she traveled, um, she was just so popular um, in foreign foreign. Um, countries because she was kind of so interested and intrigued. Um, so I, I don't know that really a lot of um, some of her Middle Eastern travels and that sort of thing really influenced her so much in any way. I haven't really seen any recipes that reflect that, but for sure, um, French, Italian, very much um, were her go-to foods. Um, so. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for 
the um, crash course in Jackie Kennedy tonight and uh, cooking some of her favorite foods. I hope you have a large family and friends group there that are going to help you consume all of that food tonight. I so wish that we could join you. I um, know. See, I love seeing it all. Um, can you tell us where we can reach you um, at Cooking with the First Ladies um, on Instagram or social media so we can keep abreast of what you're cooking? That, that, that is it, just at Cooking with the First Ladies on Instagram. Um, I actually really don't have any other social media platforms. Um, and like I said, you, you can um, check out the National First Ladies Library YouTube because they post my stuff um, when I do it for them. Um, I actually am trying to get back into more content, um, videos, et cetera. It's been kind of a busy couple months, um, uh, but you can go to my Instagram and it has any other upcoming events that I'm doing um, as well, um, which there aren't any coming up anytime soon. Um, but also you can go back from the start and see my cooking journey to this point um, if you're interested in that. But um, again, trying to get back into the creating a little bit more First Ladies content and things. Um, so that'd be really the only place. Well, Sarah Morgan, thank you so much for joining us today. It was especially wonderful to see your own personal family connections to the Kennedys. And I know that so many of our attendees tonight and so many people out there who visit the National First Ladies Historic Site or connect with the National First Ladies Library love the Kennedys. So we appreciate all of those comments and information that is rolling in. So um, if you have a story about uh, Jacqueline Kennedy that you would like to share with us that you didn't get to share with us, with us in, in the chat tonight, please join us on social media and share your stories. Or if you end up cooking any of these recipes, I know I'm gonna go make a client right after this, please share them and tag us and Sarah on social media. And until then, bon appetit, uh, cheers. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. We had a wonderful evening. Thanks so much, Sarah. And we hope to see you all at our next program. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Good night.